So I want to give you a diagram. This is the basic idea of how a jurisdiction works. This is you, and you work at Walmart, and you work in the automotive department. And there's a manager there, and he said, I'm going to pay you X amount of dollars per hour, and you have to show up here and put hours in as, as I say. And you go, okay, I agree to that. Now, what if the automotive guy tells you, I want you to show up on Sunday night at 2 o'clock in the morning when the store is not open? You could go to the manager of the Walmart store and say, this guy's trying to make me come in when we're not open. That's against your policy. The automotive manager cannot make you do something that's outside the jurisdiction of the Walmart store. Now, the Walmart store is in Detroit. This is a corporation. So now Walmart, because it's in Detroit, has to obey the rules of Detroit. Now, outside of Detroit is Michigan. It's a corporation, and Detroit is subject to the laws of Michigan. Now, Michigan is inside what is called the USA. It's another corporation, and Michigan is part of that corporation. Now, outside of this is the real USA, the original republic. Unfortunately, they sound the same. So people think that they're here when they've agreed to be in here. Just like you agreed to go here. And there's people that are wondering why the Constitution doesn't work in courts. Because the courts are here. So when you bring the Constitution in, they're going, that has nothing to do with us. You think you're here, but you're actually here. And that's the biggest problem. What you have to understand is this is subject to this. You just got to approach it in the right way. They don't, they don't tell you this, though. You're assuming you're here, and they will let you think that, but you're actually here. And you're there by agreement, just like Walmart. Now, there's another set of laws called the law merchant. This law merchant is a set of laws to govern what we call commercial law or admiralty law. Outside of this USA, and actually part of this Republic of USA, which is the original, this is where the Constitution is is what's called the common law. So the United States was founded on the common law, as was Canada, and they are still both functioning, but you gotta know how to invoke them. So once I, once I understood this and I learned a little bit about a law merchant, and then I knew that Canada was a uh, corporation, and I knew that the courts were just another corporation inside that, I started treating them like that. Just, this is just business. And you guys are subject to these outside things. So as long as I'm out here, I'm, up, I'm above you. And so I started trying stuff. I went into court. And we usually wait outside the courtroom because I don't like to doing all the bowing to the, to the judge. It's, it's very ritualistic. So we waited till the, my name got called. And we walked through the door. Big door out because it got, you know, it got paged. They obviously called the case in the courtroom, and then when I didn't show up, they page outside. So we walked through the courtroom, and as I'm walking into the courtroom, the judge is running off the bench. Full flight. Cape blowing out the door, and I went, what was that? And everybody else in the room was the same thing, like, what's, what's going on? And so the sheriff goes, all rise? Like a question, I guess we're having a break. Do people have lesser rights if they're represented by a lawyer or by an attorney? Well, your rights never uh, disappear. You waive them in order to be represented by somebody else. A judge will look at your actions. So you, if you come in saying, I got this right and I got that right, but you're represented by a lawyer, he's going, no, you, you, he, in his mind, he's just looking at you, no, you don't get it, You've, you don't have those rights. You can say that all you want, but you've waived them. Hmm. So he will assume 
that you don't have those rights and he will make his judgments safely accordingly. Is that why traditional legal processes, especially in issues of magnitude such as the worldwide agenda to deploy uh, radiating surveillance meters, is that why traditional legal processes don't seem to be successful? Exactly. Because they've taught you to go and fight down here, play this other game in courts and, and all that stuff, and that's what right. we believe is where the remedy is, and they're just looking at you, well, sorry. We have already seen in Take Back Your Power examples of how the system has singled out and wrongfully arrested a handful of those on the front lines. It's a tactic meant to inspire fear of speaking out. Let's hear about Cal's experience on the front lines a few years ago, which led to the foundation of this liability action. After the, the judge ran off the bench, I got arrested probably about a year later for driving without insurance. They thought, well, well, let's go after this guy. So they arrested me at work, and I ended up doing 60 days in jail. Throughout the 60 days, my friends put in a promissory note for my incarceration because, because this is just a business, my incarceration has to do with money. That's all, they, that's all they're in, interested in. So they, uh, they put a promissory note in and said, can you let our guy go, right? Basically paying for my incarceration. So after my 60 days, they finally found me guilty. She gave me a $1,200 fine. She tried to impose a five-year driving prohibition and she gave me one day in jail. So I said, well, if you try and give me the five-year uh, driving prohibition, you're going to be causing me harm. So she dropped that right away, and the prosecutor went, you know, like, why, you know, why did you do that? Because I'm, I'm treating her like a business. I'm negotiating with her. And she knew it, so she dropped that. And then I said, on the one day in jail, she gave me 59 days credit. So I said, I want to talk about the 59 days credit because that seems like, a, what's, how do I get 59 days credit, right? So I got one day in jail and 59 days credit. So she said, okay. All right, this is an important point. In offering the 59 days credit, right after Cal just did 60 days, the judge publicly admitted on the record that Cal was wrongfully imprisoned. But you can't give time back. And both the judge and Cal realized this. I said, the 59 days credit that you just offered me, offer in business, has to equal the amount of a promissory note that was put in by my friends. And she goes, what? And I said, there was a promissory note put in by my friends. She goes, what? And everything's done in threes. And so I started to say it again, and then she goes, okay. <laughs> she says, where was it put? I said, I believe it was put at 222 Main Street, where I was in the court, and... She goes, okay, and where in the courtroom? I said, with the clerk of the court. She says, okay. So I said, I want the 59 days credit you just offered me to equal the um, promissory note that was put in. And so she said, okay. And she, <laughs> she goes, how much was the promissory note? And I said, $300 million. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. There was a lot of lawyers in the back behind me, and they all were shocked, and she just about um, swallowed her tongue and put the gavel down and left, left the room. <laughs> so I made a deal with a corporation called The Court, with the banker that's sitting on the bench. Through all that, I ended up writing a document very similar to what you're going to see. And what ended up happening was a bunch of people in high-level politics left their job without notice. What I'm showing you is um, a very similar document to this that has ramifications that make people in very high places very uncomfortable. I also want to show you that this jurisdictional idea actually keeps going. So the document that I've written goes into these upper jurisdictions, which are what we would call spiritual jurisdictions. Now, they're not seen, but I can tell you when you start to, to um, write documents to the queen, etc., which I did, and call in her oath, 
you start to see them getting very squirmy. So you know something's there. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. So when government officials in the United States, for example, swear an oath to defend the Constitution, they do so up here. But meanwhile, they're running their corporation down here and assuming we're all down there with them because that's what our actions indicate. When we receive benefits from the state, or when we petition or appeal, or even when we vote, we are doing so down here and thus agreeing to their claim of legitimacy. So the next time the age-old question comes up, how the heck can they be getting away with this? You now have your answer. It's by our unconscious agreement. But as the system of oaths is still running up here, that tells us that the Constitution and the Republic are both still functioning. Public officials that, like the governor, they've all taken an oath of office. They've only promised to do one thing. That's all they promise is they support when they, when they take an oath of office, they say, I promise to support the Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> all you have to do is accept their oath, and this is my strong opinion, because I'm just looking for a way to stop the madness. They've taken an oath to support the Constitution. If you accept their oath in writing, then they, they are obligated, there's a contract between the two of you. So if they don't honor your constitutional rights when you put them on notice, in my strong opinion, through my research, then they're not protected by their title. They're personally liable because they've stepped outside their role. So once we're aware of this, we can then operate from up here. We can call any government agent on their oath and we can invoke their liability. By the way, this is the same setup in Canada and virtually every country.